Hurry, hurry, hurry. Amen. We're going to have we're going to have lunch at 12:30. So we got to get going. Got some things we want to do. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Hurry, hurry. Sound like an auction at the fair. Hurry, hurry. Step right up. Amen. Yeah, boy. <clears throat> Miss Baker and I went to the fair about 20 years ago on a Tuesday night. You know what it'd be like. Boy, it was, a, it was, a, it was something to behold. I won her a big teddy bear. I did. I gambled and won. When you win, it ain't gambling. <laughs> Amen. When you lose, it's gambling. <laughs> But if you win, it ain't gambling. Amen. And uh, we got on one of those uh, rides that go around and around, you know. We got on that thing. It was called the Himalaya. And we didn't realize it went backwards instead of forward. The drool was coming out of our mouth, just slinging out there. And <laughs> ah! Miss Baker, she's something public, I tell you. <laughs> Amen. Wow. We still got folks coming in. All right. I can tell you stuff while they come in, Miss. Hey, Miss Baker, how you doing? You ready to go to the fair again? Yeah. Uh huh. A couple of years ago, we were went to a school play where our grandkid goes to school, and I had to go to the restroom. And I said, "Where is the restroom?" So I said, "Let's go right around that door there, and you'll see it." Oh. Hurry, get there, you know, run around the corner, and I see the door closing, and all I see is, is uh, M-E-N. I didn't see the W-O. <laughs> so I went flying in there, and when I got in there, closed the little stall door, and I heard folks coming in, it was women coming in. I said, what are women doing in here? <laughs> and I like looking around, I thought, oh, no. I am in the ladies' restaurant. Now I got to make a way of escape. But they just kept coming in. So I checked that door. The door's locked. I ain't coming out of this stall. Now how am I going to get out of here? So I waited and waited and waited. And I said, when are these folks going to leave? So finally, I think everybody left. And I looked out the door. And I went to grab the door to go out and he opened, and here come two girls in. I said, the commode was broke, and I fixed it. <laughs> they looked at me like, I just kept on going. Uh, I lied. I got back to my seat. Miss Baker, Baker said, where have you been? I said, it's a long story, sweetheart. <laughs> it's a long story. Amen, amen. All right. Well, I've asked... Uh, uh, Brother Matthew over here and his wife to sing a sing a song and then we'll sing a congregational song and, and then we'll have some more preaching. Amen. How about y'all sing for? Wow. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's good to be in camp meeting. And uh a story like that is kinda hard to get back on the serious <laughs> side, you know. <laughs> but had a had a different song picked out and God nudged me for this one, so I like this song. Because I know where I've been. I know what it is. I hope this touches you all. Do you remember when you were drowning in a sea of sin, going down for the last time, when you called upon his name, then he reached down his nail pierced hand. And he lifted you out So remember where you were back then And thank you for where you are now 
And do you remember when With all your heart you longed to serve Him But you didn't think that Jesus How could He use someone like you? But look how He's used your life since he's brought you out so remember where you were back then and praise him for where you are now and give him the glory for what he's done in your heart he took from sin and strife and gave a new start. He took your broken life and made you complete. So remember where you He's done in your heart Cause he took you from sin and strife And he gave a new star He took my broken life And he made me complete So take off your Rounds of glory, cast them at the Savior's feet. He deserves all the glory that we have to give. Uh, yeah, yeah, give him the glory. Glory doesn't belong to me. We're gonna sing a congregation song. Our next preacher is Brother James Jones. Brother Jones, if you'll make your way over here, we'll get you mic'd up, get you ready to preach, and uh, let's sing a good congregational song. Hey. Amen. All right, let's all stand. Take right there on page one of your papers down at the bottom. He is able to deliver the amen. We'll sing the first and last. He is able to deliver the bottom of page one. Amen. Next preacher this morning is Brother James Jones, and and uh, I'm glad he could come back this year and be with us and and uh, be one of our preachers. And I've always enjoyed hearing him preach here and other places. I've heard him preach also, and uh, he has some books down there in the, in the room if you go by. Matter of fact, all kind of stuff down there. Uh, the young man you hear him sing tonight, Tommy Lamb's in our church. He has a couple of CDs. Every year we've had camp meeting. Brother Tommy has has written a song about the camp meeting that theme that year. And uh, he 
was able to uh, put them on, on a CD, and they're down there, and all kind of good stuff down there. So you make a win there. Also, I haven't mentioned this yet, just forgot about it. In our windows, our ladies have tried to decorate these windows with with the thought of uh, of his touch. And so if you get a chance, just go by and, and just uh, uh, look at them and uh, some of them put a lot of a lot of effort in this, and I think if they did, we ought to, we ought to look at it, amen. And uh, but uh, if you'll do that, and then also, you you many of you spoke to me and said, preacher, thank you for this and that, and, and I appreciate that. But uh, if you if you want to thank anybody, thank the Lord first, and just speak to the people down there and just say, you know, we appreciate what you're doing, and uh, thank you for the meeting. They uh, they're the ones I really and truly uh, they got a lot more faith than I got. They really do. They're, they're as confident as they can be. I'm the one's weak. Somebody said, how you doing? I said, I'm trying to pastor this church, but I think they pastored me. And uh, so the Lord's given us a, a, a good work. Amen. Love you, love you, Preachers love you, people. Amen. And uh, if you love them a little bit, they might love you back. Amen. Sit up straight now. Get your Bible out. You've had a, you've had a good restroom break. Got a drink of water. Or you'll be good to go for two or three hours. Amen. But he's not going to preach that long because he knows lunch is waiting too. Come on, Brother Jones. Amen. But you preach what the Lord's give you, my friend. Thank you for being here, preacher. What Thank you, you, Pastor. Well, as Dr. David Gibbs would say, thinking about all this preaching we've heard, wow. We had a missionary by our church, and I'd heard him preach at a camp meeting. And the moderator had asked him to come after a couple of fellows who have preceded me this morning. And he got up and he said this, I feel like a cricket after a thunderstorm. (laughs) So I guess maybe that expresses the way I feel this morning. The music has been so good as it always is. And good preaching, the fellowship is just phenomenal. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. You'll open your scriptures there, chapter 9. And my opening comments are not meant to be critical, but I trust they will be constructive. There's a lot of people who will not attend a good Bible preaching church. And so they form their little groups and have what they call Bible studies. And should any of you ever be allured toward one of them, there are some questions that ought to be of great concern to you. Number one, who was Adam and Eve? How did they get here, and what impact have they had upon our world? The second one is, who was Abraham? And the promises which God has made unto Abraham, are they still in effect, or have they been transferred to the church? And then the third one is, Who is Jesus Christ? Is he the eternal Son of God? Was he God manifest in the flesh? And he is he absolutely the only way to eternal life? Is there any other means of obtaining it? Now our text is going to deal with with the last one. We are in Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to begin our reading at verse 11 and read down through verse 15. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer 
sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Would you please pray with us and for us? Father, how we thank you to be in this meeting how our spirits have been lifted and our souls refreshed. Thank you by the good preaching of the Word of God, how that you've ministered to my heart. The great singing of the songs of Zion that's blessed us. The moments of fellowship that we've had with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you so much for the privilege we have to be here. And Lord, I surely stand in dire need of your touch upon my life. And I pray to have it that I might glorify you and that the listener might be edified. Lord, we do ask our prayer in Christ's name and we pray it for his sake. Amen and amen. Hebrews, as you are aware, was written on the basis of a contrast, and rightly so. Now, Mr. Noah Webster defines contrast as to compare, as to reveal difference, a difference, especially a striking difference. Actually, Hebrews is an exhortation. We do not find the apostle fussing at these Hebrew believers, nor do we find him quarreling at them or criticizing them. But in the closing chapter, he refers to his work as an exhortation. We read in chapter 13, verse 22, And I beseech you, brethren, Suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. And so the apostle is somewhat concerned about their being on the threshold of a return to the Judaism that they've been converted out of into Christianity. And when we come to chapter 10, we read about much of the persecution and the heartache and the strife and the loss that they had suffered. And the apostle is somewhat concerned, are they going to think it was easier on us where we were than where we have become? And so the apostle is writing, trying to encourage them to continue on. And here is what he has to say to them. Christianity is better than Judaism. Grace is better than law. And faith is better than works. And the New Testament is better than the Old Testament. Eternal is better than the temporal. And Christ's blood is better than animal blood. And so what I want to preach a few minutes on is the surpassing work of Christ. Now again, I went into the dictionary to look upon this word surpassing. It means to do more or to be superior to. And so we're talking about his work. And the work of Christ was more and far superior than to any works by any religionist, even including the Old Testament Judaism. It also means to go beyond the limit 
Now, Judaism was a religion, and God had founded the Jews in that religion so that he could have a spokesman in their behalf between him and them. And all of the Old Testament economy under Judaism was pointing to one figure, and that figure was the Christ who was going to come. And so you are aware of all the types in the Old Testament. Every one of them pointed to Jesus, and Jesus fulfilled every one of them. Now, what I'm saying is Judaism was good in its day, but it had a limit. Now, Christ comes, and his work goes far beyond the limit that Judaism could go. And there's a whole lot involved here. Now, Judaism was a powerful religion, but Christ is much more powerful. And it means to be superior to the capacity of. And Judaism had a great capacity, but it cannot touch the capacity of Christ's work. Their work was limited. It was temporal. Their priest would die, and another priest would have to come. The people must become acquainted with the new priest. Thank God we have had one priest, and we never have, will have, but one. And he ever liveth, amen, to make intercession for them, amen, that come unto God by him. And so I praise the Lord for the Lord Jesus and his great work that he has accomplished in our behalf. Now, I want to look at our text, and there's about nine things here, and so we'll get started on these. We may go through all nine, and we may hang up on one or two. But when we're talking about the surpassing work of Christ, we see a better Person, And it's found here in verse 11. But Christ, Christ is the sent one. Christ is the second person in the Godhead. He is not second in degree, but he is second for the purpose of identity. We do not have God the Father up here and God the Son down here, and God the Holy Ghost here. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. They are three in one. Now, some religions say that we believe in three gods, but that is untrue. We believe in one God manifested in three persons. And God, now this is what gets some of them, but the God of the Old Testament wrapped himself in flesh and came in the person of the Son and tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory, amen, the glory as of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he died on the cross and he stayed dead three days and he arose from the dead on the third day like he said that he would. His work is eternal. Amen. The Bible says here that he had obtained eternal redemption for us. The best work that the Judaism could do would be for a day, for a week, for a month, and the longest period for a year. And that's as long as it would last. But Jesus Christ came to do an eternal work. I'm glad, dear brother, thank you for your good singing and your family singing. I'm glad I got on the end or beginning of something that's never going to end. And it is eternal redemption. He is the second person. His work, he is an eternal being. Now, years ago when I lived in Florida, a lady knocked on my door one uh, Saturday morning. Of course, I had some idea 
of who she might be, and it's strange, but she came by herself. And she said, I want to talk to you about God. I said, well, go right ahead. I stood in the door, and I said, you go right ahead. And so she started talking to me about God, and she mentioned Jesus. I said, oh, Jesus. I said, yeah. I said, who is that? And she said, well, he's the son of God. I said, that's exactly right. And, uh, and so I said, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And she said, now, I, I don't believe the Bible reads quite like that. I said, well, I believe it does. And so she pulled out her little green uh, New World's translation, and she opened it up to John 1.1, 1, 1, and it read, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And I said, no, ma'am. I said, that indefinite article is not in the text. And she said, oh, said, uh, well, I, I, I thought it was. I said, no, ma'am, it's not in there. And she said, well, you know, she said, I believe a man might could do better talking to you than a woman. I said, well, whatever you think. And so she left and I didn't hear any more about that situation. And here is something else they say, that nowhere does God, does Jesus Christ claim to be God. Well, they ought to read their Bible, and they would find out, amen, I and my Father are one. That's just one place that he claimed to be God. And if you remember, the Jews took up stones to stone him because of what he'd said, and they knew by what he said that he was claiming to be God. Amen. And so he was God of very God. So what we see here is a superior person who is Christ, the eternal Christ of God. And then secondly, we see a better priest. Now, we read here in our text, an high priest of good things to come. You see, the Old Testament priest did not warrant good things to come. The best the Old Testament priest could do is when he came out and presented himself unto the people on the high day of atonement, and sins had been rolled ahead, if you want to use that phrase, for another year, the best thing the Old Testament priest could do was say, good things has been done. But he could not talk about good things that were to come. But the greater priest here could talk about good things that had to be done. Amen. God, his work did not remain because he had to go back and do this same work over and over and over. But aren't you glad for our great high priest, which is passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now I've heard all kinds of things, and I'm not trying to be critical. I've heard people say, you ought to junk your, your profession. I'm not junking mine. I'm holding mine fast because I know who my profession is in. Amen. I know whom. Now, listen to this, and pardon this digression. Just a moment, would you please? Now, Paul did not say, I know when I believed. That's very important. Amen. Yeah. He did not say, I know what I believe. I know that's important. Yeah. Uh, and he did not say necessarily, I know why I believed. All of those are important. But he said, I know whom. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I know whom yeah. I have believed. Yeah. And I am persuaded yeah. that he's able to keep I that which day. I've committed yeah. unto him yeah. against that day. Yeah. Now, I'm not casting that away for any preacher for any movement, amen. I like what Brother Weaver was preaching a while ago. There's a whole lot I don't remember when I got saved. But I do remember this, that I was a sinner. 
And somehow the Holy Ghost made me see I was a sinner and made me see I needed to be saved and made me see there was but one person who could save me. And out of my heart of faith, Brother Ford, I cried upon him and he heard my cry and he saved my soul. And I've been saved ever since. And amen. I don't know that I felt any different, but I was different. And that afternoon it took a hold on me and I knew something had happened I didn't understand. I didn't understand redemption. Somebody asked me one time, said, did you repent when you got saved? I said, I sure did. He said, did you tell God you repent? I said, didn't have to. Amen. He knew what happened inside me. Amen. Why is it we have to try to make a man a theologian in order to get him saved? Amen. We need to know we're a sinner and there's but one who can save us and we'll call upon him. He'll save us by his grace. He's our priest. Amen. He's offered up a sacrifice accepted by God and the only sacrifice that ever has or ever will be accepted by God. I had these bicyclists come by. And I was talking to him about the scriptures because they like to talk about that. And they pulled out their King James Bible. And I said, that's a wonderful book. He said, yes, sir, it is. It's just the Bible we have. I said, that's wonderful. I said, is that all you have? Is that all you read? He said, well, he said, uh, we got the Book of Mormon. I said, what is that? He said, well, it's just, it said, it's a book. said, uh, it reads just like this Bible. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I'll give you one of them. And I said, uh, and that, that, by, that Book of Mormon reads exactly like this Bible. He said, yes, sir. I said, why do you need both of them? <laughs> One of them ought to be sufficient if they read, but they don't read. And he he had one, of course, all marked up for me. And I I had in my pocket a tract written by Dr. John R. Rice, What Must I Do to Be Saved? One of the best gospel tracts. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make you a deal. He said, what? I said, if you'll read this tract, from front all the way to the back, I'll read everything you've got marked in that book. Now, I kept my part of the deal. I don't know if he did or not. But you know what the Book of Mormons keeps saying? There is more. There is more. There is more. Our Bible says there is no more. There is no more. How about that? And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, John 19, 30, it is finished. Amen. It was finished. Okay, I'm going to step off in a little more water here. And I'm not trying to be critical. If it was finished, you don't have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. You ought to be. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you ought to be. But Christ paid the sin debt in full when he died on Calvary. Everything that you and I needed was taken care of by him, and God was pleased. He set him down on his right hand. And to which of the angels saith he at any time, sit thou on my right hand? Amen. Thou art my, my beloved son. This day, how, which he only said that to one person. Amen. And that's where that's that's what we are depending on and leaning on today. The priest work was never done, but Christ's work was finished forever. So we see a better person, we see a better priest, and we see a better price. Neither by the, well, actually, 
I don't have any notes. I just got this one last night. But we see a better place. I'll let you fellas work on that. All right? A more perfect tabernacle. Yeah. Woo. Now listen, if I'm, if I'm getting this right, if I, he entered in to the very presence of God. Amen. God had to come down to meet with man in the tabernacle, but Jesus went up and met with God in the most holy place. Amen. So it's a better place. I just happened to see that. All right. And, and notice this, neither by, so that makes 10. All right. So neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Amen. So that is the better price. Streams of animal blood flowed under Judaism. Times there were hundreds, and when the temple was dedicated, there were thousands of animals slain. You can imagine the amount of blood, and all the way from uh, the book of Genesis, uh, when the offering was accepted of God by Abel, it was offered up, and all the blood that ran through in Egypt, can you imagine how much blood was in the land of Egypt that night? when Israel uh, slew a lamb and took its blood and shed it and put it on the doorpost and across the lintel and all the blood that was poured out of those animals that died that night, can you imagine how much blood, what a container it would take to hold all of the blood uh, of the animals that were shed in the Old Testament? Let me tell you right now, one drop of Christ's blood is more potent than all of that blood put together. Amen. So he took his blood and went in to the most holy place. Amen. And put it on the mercy seat. And I believe that's exactly where it is right now. I don't believe it fell uh, to the ground and rotted. Exactly how it all happened, I do not know. But I'm telling you, if God is the God this Bible says he is, he could have gathered every bit of it up himself. I don't believe one drop of it went to waste. I don't believe that one drop, I don't believe one drop of it can decay. Amen. I believe it's the very blood of God. Acts chapter 20. Amen. And he shed that blood and I believe that blood is on the mercy seat right now availing for you and I. Amen. I was saved. Dr. Finney, I was saved when I was a boy. I'm being saved right now. Amen. And I'm saved eternally by the same offering and by the same blood that was offered up by Jesus Christ. There's no price ever been paid greater than the price that Jesus paid. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. And so that blood is there keeping me. I try to live right. I try to honor God with my life. But I'm not going to heaven because of that. I'm going to heaven because there is something on the mercy seat that's keeping me pure and holy in the sight of God. I bless his holy name. I really do. Christ, listen, he entered. I'm hurrying. Christ entered into the holy place. Amen. He became our surety. And you know what a surety is. A surety is the guarantor that the contract is going to be fulfilled. Amen. God placed himself between mankind and himself in the person of sin, of the Son, and he becomes our surety. I'm going to heaven, Brother Baker. I'm going to heaven, but not because of who I am, but because of who he is, not because of what I've done, but because of what he has done. Not because of what I stand for, but because of what he stands for. I'm telling you, he's our surety. He's our guarantee that we're going to get there. Okay, his redeemed one, all right, and one thing only, his own blood. Not his perfectly keeping the law, 
and that he did do. Not his sinless life, and that he lived. Not his sonship, amen, and that he was, but by his own blood. He entered in once. Now listen, listen carefully. He entered in by that means. He didn't have to have a means to enter in. He could have went back to heaven any time he would have wanted to go back to heaven. He was God the Son. He didn't need access, but he went in. Now watch it. Now listen. Let, let's look at our text here. But by his own blood, he entered in once into his holy place. Not because he had to have it, but because he wanted to give it. And he wanted to take it for you and I. He could have entered in. Let me repeat myself. He could have entered in at any time he wanted to. But he would have had to have gone in without blood. And if he had gone in without blood... He would have had to have gone in alone. You look please in this chapter verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. I would be standing guilty before almighty God for my sins. There is not one sin I've ever committed that I could have remitted had it not been for this blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He entered in not for himself, but he entered in for you and he entered in for me. He is our forerunner. Amen. Had he no blood, you and I that are saved by the grace of God would have been left behind forever. But because he took, amen, because I'm feeling all right now, because he took that blood in and he became our forerunner, now he's made a way that you and I can follow. That's what the forerunner did. He went in to claim success. He went in to claim victory. He went in to provide a way for for you and I to go. I bless his name. And he just didn't go in. He's entered in behind the veil. As one preacher said it, uh, we are anchored. And that anchor is behind the veil. But the anchor is not holding us. The anchor is pulling us in that direction. We're headed to glory because Christ went in for you and me. And we're saved by his grace. This proved by his own blood. He's a sin barrier. He's a substitute in our place. I love every song that talks about what Jesus suffered for you and I. And how that the punishment Jesus received should have been ours. And that is true. But you know what? Had we died on the cross like Jesus did, we still wouldn't go to heaven. When Jesus Christ hung, suspended between heaven and earth, he suffered the hell for the sinner. Now someone says God won't send the sinner to hell. They'll find out but it'll be too late. When we rejected God's own means of redemption and salvation for lost mankind, turned our nose up at it, stiffened our necks, brazened our face, or whatever we did, and we said no to God. If a person dies in that state, they will go to hell. They have rejected the only means of salvation. Christ died for the sin of the whole world. Amen. I believe this. I believe, and I stand to be corrected, but I believe in those dark hours when God turned the light out on the earth because of the nakedness of his son and that gazing crowd and mocking crowd upon him. Jesus Christ was suffering the punishment of the wicked 
Somebody said, how could he do that in three hours? I'll tell you exactly. Christ was an infinite person, and he could suffer infinitely for lost mankind. Yes. Amen. He didn't have to go to hell. I don't believe he did. Now, I'm not going to argue with anybody. I don't believe he went into the flames. I believe he suffered all that hell had when he hung on that cross. Amen. Amen. When they put him into that tomb, amen, he went right on down into the bowels of the earth and to the paradise section, which was called Abraham's bosom. And he made an announcement. He didn't try to evangelize that crowd on the other side of that great gulf, but he made an announcement. I'm here. I'm here. Noah preached about me coming. I want you to know I have come. And I'm going to take these out of Abraham's bosom and I'm going to take them to a higher world. And so now, hallelujah, when we, when we die now as a saint, we don't go down into the bowels of the earth. We go up into the paradise with God. All because Jesus Christ went in to the most holy place and offered his blood up there. Or you can think about Satan still has access. Give me two more minutes. Satan, ha- Satan has access to the presence of God. He's the accuser of the brethren. But all the father has to do is look over at that blood and the son say, I I took care of all of that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, God is good, isn't he? God is good. He sure is. Now that he has done that, our sin has been put away. Our sins and iniquities. Well, I remember no more. You see, we're not only clothed in righteousness. That would be wonderful. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. That was a type. We're clothed. But we've been made the righteousness of God. That is a difference. Amen. I don't feel it, but you're looking at righteous James. I've been declared that legally. By God Almighty, because Christ shed his blood in our behalf. Oh, my, what a price. What a price. A greater price. His blood. He hath made him to be sin for us. Oh, what a trade. (laughs) That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. is coming to pee out. This is probably the most important invitation we're going to give this day. This one right here. I'm sitting there and listening to him go through this and you and I heard say, most of us, we know that. Should know that. Some may not. The likelihood that somebody here today is not saved. Wrote down, he, I just, when he, right toward the end, I wrote down a little piece of paper, a Bible, wrote these two words, too late. Don't wait too late. And if you're here today, it doesn't matter who you're with, how old you are, what position you hold, don't wait too late to be saved. And uh, uh, if, if, you'd, if you'd have met uh, Nicodemus, you'd have thought he's a pretty good fella. But uh, he wasn't. Jesus revealed that. And so uh, this invitation is for, maybe maybe you've got somebody here today or you know somebody here that's lost, I want you to pray for them. And if you are lost, why don't you come get saved today? But the greatest thing you ever, the greatest thing ever happened in your life is get saved. You just had that, his precious blood, and wash away all your sins. Make you, make you perfect and pure in the Father's eyes. Don't wait too late. Let's stand our feet. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll bless this invitation.
you've sort of nudged my heart. Somebody here needs to be saved. Who they are, where they're sitting or standing, I do not know. Could be a lady, could be a daughter, son, grandchild, a grandmother or grandfather. Whoever it is, Lord, you speak to their heart. And Lord, those who are here who, who are saved, that know of people that need to be saved, that are here or back home, I pray, God, you'll burden our heart to come and pray in this invitation. Please, Holy Spirit, move in our midst and take this message and speak to some lost sinner's life. In thy name I pray. Amen. Would you come. Calling today. You're here, you've, you've wrestled with that. My wife was a preacher's wife, sang in a choir, taught Sunday school, but she's lost. Brother, Brother Jones said he gave that man a track by Dr. Rice. It's a simple plan of salvation. I was on a visitation on Tuesday night, and I came home. My wife had gotten saved, listening to Dr. Rice. She got that track out. And a preacher's wife got saved. Well, we had a time in church. And she came forward and said, I I got saved last night. Don't wait too late. You can, you know. Yeah. I think the saddest word in hell will be the word almost. Don't let that be you. That's what Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me of your Christian. Almost. Be saved today. Be saved. Jesus is tenderly calling. Remember when he called you? <laughs> I remember when he, when he called me the night I got saved. Oh, boy. Pray for your lost people. I got family members need to be saved. I, I send them stuff. I, I send them sermons I preach, other preachers preach, hoping and praying that somehow or another God will use that message or speak to their heart. Just water, water, water what's been planted. Amen. God will give the increase. verse Ruth one more verse let this be your verse that's what the preacher said the night I got saved he said young man it's your last time if you don't get saved tonight you'll know, God never speak to you again you'll die and go to hell that's what he said Listen, if you let go of that pew that'll be your first step I let go of the pew that's first step. I stepped out of that pew and came. I got saved somewhere between there and here. Did you repent? I don't know if I did or not. I know I asked Jesus in my heart. Changed my life. Must have. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. You can be seated. Now, listen, we've got just a few minutes here. And uh, 
I, I, he's sitting there preaching. I said, I'd like to sit up on the Brother, Brother Jones just for in classes, let him teach. I mean, just preach it, teach it, whatever you want to do. That's just good stuff. Oh, my soul. All right, we got uh, uh, we, we got some for all the ladies here and all the men, all the preacher's wives and all the preachers. We got something for you. But before we do that, uh, we want all the preachers to stand. All the preachers, if you're a pastor or church or full, full-time now, we're talking about full-time, or maybe you're retired, and we want you to stand, okay? And if you're still in high school, you're not ready to preach yet, okay? We're talking about all the, all the adult men, men, men <laughs> that have been called to preach. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to want you to take a number, and we got some stuff we're going to give you. Okay, we're going if we call your number, you get something. Okay, we're going to start over here. I got this glare over here. I right, I see, brother humble, you be number one. All right, then you be. All right, next. Four. four. Can't have two fives. Next. Say it, eight, where's nine? Say it out loud, nine. Fifty-seven. That's how we got here this morning. We had a lot more than that last night. Who did I miss? Fifty what? Eight. What was you? You're fifty-eight, brother Ford. You're fifty-eight. You're the oldest oldest preacher here. Fifty-eight. Okay. All right. We got some gift certificates. We're gonna give to. This paper's gonna come. Yes. Oh, Brother Bill Pitsenbarger, all right? You'll be 59, Brother Bill, 59. We don't want to miss anybody. Amen. 59. This is a gift certificate for $500. No, it ain't $500. <laughs> oh, I got you excited, didn't you? Oh, boy. Amen. To Cracker Barrel, $75. Okay, we're going to give two away this morning, two tonight, two tomorrow morning, and two tomorrow night, okay? And they're for $75. My wife and I took our son out to Cracker Barrel last week and for his birthday. We sat there and had a great time and, and got ready to leave and uh, left the lady a nice tip. And we got, got in the car and just drove off. Didn't pay a dime for it. <laughs> she got, we got over, the, left the product, was coming over to the interstate. And my wife said, did you, did you pay the bill? I said, no. She said, I didn't think so. And then my son said, Mama, did Daddy pay the bill on the way out? She said, well, I think he did, but I didn't. That's just their loss. <laughs> no, I went around and went back. Okay, what's the first number, Miss Baker? <laughs> we went to 50 what? 59, 59, okay. Number 15. Where's number 15? All right. Hey, man. How about that? I believe this is a first time preacher. Is that correct? First time here. Hey, you like Cracker Barrel? All right, here we go. Come up here. Introduce yourself. What's your name? Richard Smith. Richard Smith. Who'd you come with, Richard? Brother Paul Mitchell. Oh, man, no. 
Yeah, I didn't want to admit it, <laughs> but you made me. <laughs> Amen. Brother Paul's a great guy. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. You coming Thank back? You. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. All right. What, all right. What's the next number? He's dropping them everywhere. All right, that's 15. We'll put it right here. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh-oh. It's between 30 and 40. You ready? What number is it, Miss Baker? 34. 34. Where's 34 at? Right there. Look uh, here. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. What a blessing, preacher. You need to crack a barrel? Yeah, now. All right, where are you from? Roxborough, North Carolina. And what's your name? Jack Hilliard. Jack Hilliard. Well, Jack, you look tip-top sharp. <laughs> hey, man. God bless you, baby, Jack. Thanks for coming. All right. Isn't that good? All right. Well, we got about, listen, 12.30, they're waiting on us. All right. So this morning... On your way out, the preacher's wives will, uh, we have a gift for you back there. Miss Bird, you want to come and say anything about these bags for these ladies? Brother Bo, you want to get your books out up here and go ahead and put them out on the on the uh, 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 altar up here? I'll do the other side in a minute. Miss Helen, let me give you a microphone. He had all the Preachers stand. I'd like for all the preachers' wives there and would stand up, please, if you can. You can be seated. We thank you for coming. It's our pleasure to have you. Um, I want you to do one thing for me. Take a deep breath, everybody. That's his touch. Yeah. You just got it. You know the last touch he'll give you? He'll take your last breath. <laughs> but it's our pleasure to have you, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't talked to your wife this morning, Dust balls, you know you're made out of dust. And us, men, us women was your rib. So if you haven't told your rib that you love her this morning, now's the time to do it. Yeah, I love your rib. <laughs> That's just, a, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Everybody needs to laugh. Um, all the ladies that's here that has that has been preachers' wives or are preachers' wives or if you're a missionary's wife, and we'll probably have enough for the singers' wives too. Um, meet me in the back. Back there, we have a bag for you. Yeah, load uh, it down. The evangelist wives too. I don't want to leave anybody out um, but we have a bag back there and on this bag is a tag with the lady that fixed this bag for you and some of them have a picture of the person on their bag and some of them does it but the name and address is on there um, if you get something in your bag that you can't use find somebody that can and share it that's a sharing bag. This bag can go to the grocery store with you because it's got on there pray, and I'm not sure what the other one, but it's all about prayer. So it's a witness bag also. So I will meet you back there on the back row. Also, we have a clothes closet at the church, women, and we got some men's clothes and some baby clothes over there. So all you women can go back. That's for anybody that wants clothes. Yeah. There's not a whole lot, but there is some back there. And we, again, we thank you for coming.
Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, Brother Jack Shook. Could you come up here, Brother Jack? Where are you at? Is he here? Come up here, Brother Jack. And uh, appreciate Brother Sister Shook. Amen. All right, Brother Jack, you going to come back next year? You able? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, next year I want you to come back and be one of my preachers. Okay? And I want you to come up here and I want you to pray and ask God to bless our food. Amen. Boy, we have some good preaching having a brother. Amen. Amen. All right, preachers, you come, yeah, you come by, get any one book, not one of each, but any one book from Brother Wagner's list over here. He's got a whole bunch of them. You ain't got to be in a hurry because, you know, we, you got, we, we back at 5.30 to eat again. So you eat now, you'll eat again. We believe in eating right here. Get you any one book. And then over here, we have uh, this particular book. Is I've read this book when I got it. I sat down and, and read it in one in one sitting. Magnified by life and by death. And uh, boy, I tell you what, uh, by Bud Silva out in California, his wife and two of his children, and nine people killed in a church van. And it's about his life. And as a result of what God had did in his life after that tragic, taking him to school. And uh, so it's about that. It's about his life and what happened. So we want to give you this book. You'll enjoy it. And uh, uh, I had the privilege of meeting Brother Silva. And boy, what a great Christian he is. A great man, a great preacher. So hope you'll enjoy that book. We get any one book. And then uh, over here we have these for you. Okay? Brother Jack, would you ask God to bless our food? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you especially for what our hearts and our ears have heard this morning. Father, we thank you for these men that faithfully deliver the word of God. Father, we pray that you'd bless the ladies that have prepared the food for us, bless the food to the nourishment of our body, and we'll give you the praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, 